If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, he shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. I have heard what the prophets said, that prophecy lies in my name saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten me, my name for Baal. The prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord, of host, our God. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you, in the city that I gave you and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you, and a perpetual shame, which shall not be forgotten. All right, what you're seeing on your screen is another very interesting book called Wandering Stars, Contending for the Faith with the New Apostles and Prophets by Keith Gibson, for by Craig Branch. Uh, and then on the cover here, you can see that's Todd Bentley, one of their prophets, with his adoring crowds, waving their arms and taking in every last word the man has to say. Mm. We're going to get into some of these self-proclaimed prophets and apostles. Right. Because they're saying that, you know, basically these guys are claiming they're pro apostles and prophets like we find in the Bible. Right. So basically, if that's the case, it's like you mentioned before, if that's the case, 
then whatever they say, they're getting straight from God, so it should be Scripture. Right. They can speak Scripture if they exactly. are true, true prophets and if they are defined as the New Testament apparently defines uh, a prophet. Certainly the Old Testament prophet was held to a high standard of credibility, perfection. Exactly. He can't be wrong. He can't miss it. I, and I, I know that uh, there's discussion as to the use of the term prophetess in the New Testament, but by and large, whether you, t whether you take it as, uh, as forth-telling, which I think these guys are, are saying that we are forth-telling the Word of God. Well, in some cases, sometimes they're just proclaiming, proclaiming thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. This is the Word of God. Now, what you're referring yeah. to, you've got to be 100% accurate. Yeah, that's If you say, thus saith the Lord, or God said this, this will happen. Well, then yeah. you're putting yourself as a prophet of God in the context of the Scripture, Old Testament or New Testament. Yeah. And there's no room for error no whatsoever. Room for error. Yeah. And we already know from the arguments of the Charismatics, they themselves admit they're false prophets in the sense of being fallible prophets. Right. They can yeah. make mistakes, but yet they're still prophets because sometimes right. they get their predictions right. Now, it's interesting, uh, uh, you've got a lot of the uh, occultic fortune tellers and uh, people uh, in spiritism and things like this that foretell the future, crystal ball gazers, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, palm readers and, yeah. and all this type of stuff. Uh, there used to be a famous, and she had a lot of her predictions you now back in the 1960s and 70s and she passed away. She was, she was an occultist. Uh, that they put her column in the newspaper. She was into astrology, and she was like the most famous astrologer. But even she was like 67% right in her predictions using astrology, which we know is condemned by the Bible. Right, sure. Uh, and so the Charismatics and Pentecostals have, when they're doing real good, they're close to her, her percentages. But most of the time, they're not even as good as her percentages. Right. Now, she's doing it as a, for a business, you know. And, and, of course, it's easy to look up current events and get an idea what you could prophesy mm -hmm. to give you a better chance. Right. And that's really what she was involved in, mm -hmm. to give her such a, a, a percentage that's 67% right, 33% wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you've got these other guys that probably do a lot of the same thing. Uh, but... Uh, at the same time, their, per their percentage is still not as good. Yeah, and I think, Larry, that this is, this is the whole setup here. When you have men calling themselves prophets in the predictive sense of the word, and they're prophesying the return of the Lord, that's the favorite thing to do. Right, right, right. Or they're prophesying the end of the world, or they're prophesying the, uh, the fall of the American currency or something like this. They set themselves up with a bullseye on them, really, because mm -hmm. it's easy to say, eh, you're wrong. <laughs> you're, just, you're, wrong. you're not a prophet uh -huh. in that sense. Right. And I think it can be proven conclusively that that aspect of prophecy is gone. Mm -hmm. I don't think there has been a man who, other than these charlatans and these fakes and these wizards, who stand up and say, I right, look. December 14th, 2015, Jesus is going to return to him. We've gone through all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They're phony. They're false prophets. Right. We hold them to that standard. But now, here's a greater issue. If we take prophecy, that word used in 1 Corinthians 14, as a gift given to the body of mm -hmm. Christ, and you, you have to understand it not in the foretelling sense, but in the proclamation sense. Mm -hmm. Does not the Bible tell us when a prophet speaks, he is to be tested by those sitting there and listening to him? That's right. That is right. Mm -hmm. So let's hear what these guys have to say. <laughs> and we will be sitting here. Mm -hmm. I'll be sitting here as a teacher of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You'll be sitting there as a teacher of the Word of God. And we will see if they are, in fact, true prophets or false prophets. And, Larry, we can do this on the strength of the Word of God and let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. 
If a revelation is made to another who is seated, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. Miss that again to the viewers. What, what verse is that? Well, I'm reading 1 Corinthians 14. In 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle Paul regulates speaking in tongues, interpreting the tongues that are spoken, and the gift of prophecy for the edification of the local body. And he is absolutely specific if somebody wants to prophesy, have at it, but you will be judged in what you say by those seated near you. Your proclamation will be judged by your fellow prophets to see if there's any truth to the matter. You can't just stand up there and say, I'm a prophet, thus saith the Lord, this is from the Lord, and then go back and expect everybody to pass the offering plate and give you money. It doesn't work that way. They were very, very much regulated, and the Apostle Paul is, he loves the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. He loves it. Mm -hmm. he, really want, he really wants this proclamation, this exhortation, this teaching, this, this verbal um, uh, message to the body of Christ for edification. He wants yes. that. But he wants it regulated because many false prophets have arisen. Exactly. And we are saying that these birds, the guys that you're about to introduce us to, mm -hmm. are false prophets. Mm -hmm. And it is with full authority from Scripture for us to examine to see if these things are true. All right. Now, these self-proclaimed prophets, mm -hmm. uh, the, as you may mention in this series so well and so often, and I can't, uh, in a way I can't uh, say it enough. We, we really can't say it enough. You've got to stick enough. to the Word of God to yeah. get past these guys. Yeah. How, if you how don't, are we going to test them? Right. Otherwise, they, it's going to be one prophet versus the other prophet. That's right. They don't want to be tested. Yeah. That's exactly right. They do not want to be tested. Right. And they violate the Word of God even in that, as you just pointed out. Yeah. In look, looking forward in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, here, here's the trump card. Oh, yeah. That we don't have with us, but we have his writings. That's right. Listen to what he has to say about these prophets. If anyone thinks he is a prophet, or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. That's right. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. <laughs> so the trump card is the Apostle Paul. That's right. You can prophesy all day long, but if you don't follow my command, it's worthless. That's right. If and, you don't line up with the Word of God. Right which is, as Peter already said in 2 Peter chapter yeah. 3, verse 16, yeah. that his words are the word of God. Right. If it doesn't line up, that guy's out of here. Forget about it. That's it. Right. Which That's is it. one word in New Jersey, by the way. Forget about it. Uh -huh. In fact, I think, right? I, I, think I think a lot of these self-proclaimed prophets and uh, apostles know about this. Yeah. And this is why they have such a low view of Scripture. And you're going to hear about it, right, okay. as we go. Let's okay, go. to page 80 here, we see prophets, these self-proclaimed prophets, uh, these Pentecostal charismatic prophets, uh, on the inspiration of Scripture. In his book, The Final Quest, Rick Joyner lists four levels of inspiration, ranging from impressions to trances. The more advanced the level, the more certain it is that a word is coming from God in an uncorrupted form. What is immediately startling is that Joyner places the New Testament epistles at only the second level of inspiration. This is extremely concerning when one reads what he says about this level. Uh, consider the following. Now, here's, here's Prophet Rick Joyner mm. talking about the Scripture. Mm. The next level of inspiration is a conscious sense of the presence of the Lord or the anointing of the Holy Spirit which gives special illumination to our minds. This often comes when I am writing or speaking, or it gives me much greater confidence in the importance or accuracy of what I am saying. I believe that this was probably experienced by the apostles as they wrote the New Testament epistles. This will give us great confidence, but it is still a level where we can still be influenced by our prejudices doctrines, etc. So this is a level two that you're telling everybody to use as a standard 
according to this prophet, Rick Joyner. What do you have to say about that? So the Word of God is a level two. Yeah, it's not what, even the best level. What, what the Apostle Paul writes, clearly writes, is level two. Right. Okay. And he's influenced by his prejudices, his doctrines, and other things going on. <laughs> Here's what I have to say from the Apostle Paul. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. All his listeners are bearing beautifully this absolute corrupt nonsense that he is purveying as part of his... Because he's approach. trying to move him away from what the Word of God actually says yeah. because he Level. already knows he's not preaching yeah. the same thing. <laughs> So how do we know when he reaches the level that's beyond level two? When he says so. When he says so. <laughs> so he places himself above the Apostle Paul, not even on an equal plane, mm -hmm. because all we have are the writings of the Apostle Paul, but he can go to another level. Based on what he's teaching. Based you know, on that, he's that's teaching. the implication. Yeah. All right, now let's go on to page 91. The viewers at home can see this. Uh, the New Testament apostles didn't teach the scriptures either. Okay, uh, this self-proclaimed charismatic Pentecostal type prophet uh, named Jack Deere, here's what it says. Former Dallas Theological Seminary professor Jack Deere attempts to provide cover for all of the extra biblical teaching occurring in today's church by boldly asserting that Jesus and the apostles didn't teach the Bible either. Now here's what he says, quote, you know I'm going to look up every reference to teaching in the Bible. So I just punched it in my computer concordance, looked up every single reference, taught, teacher, teaching, every single reference in the New Testament, and it is astounding. Did you know not one time, not one time does it say that Jesus taught the Bible? Isn't that interesting? Not one time does it ever say that. It says he taught about the kingdom, taught about God, preached the gospel of the kingdom and the good news. Not one time does it ever say he taught the Bible. I looked up all the references with the apostles and did you know that with only one possible exception, it never says the apostles taught the Bible. Here's the last verse in the book of Acts, verse 31. Here's how it ends with what Paul's doing. Verse 31, boldly and without hindrance, he preached not the Bible, the kingdom of God. And he taught not the Bible, but taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so basically Jack Deere, the Dallas Theological Seminary professor, is telling us that... Former professor. Former, right. oh, yeah, very good. Yeah, he, yeah, that's, he was that's, one. He was one of my professors. When oh, I was you there. had him as a I professor. Had yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I know him. So, so in fact, that's what makes this kind of even more scary. It does. He, here he was a professor at Dallas Theological, your alma mater. Yeah. And he's saying this kind of stuff, that Jesus never taught the Bible, the apostles never taught the Bible. What do you have to say to that? All right, I have two things to say to that. In the, in the first place, if you're looking for a book chapter and verse that says Jesus taught the Bible, you're not going to find that terminology in the New Testament. You're not going to find the terminology, the Apostle Paul taught the Bible. Okay, these are modern terms that we use for people who are teachers. What you will find, however, is the exact equivalent. Let me give you an example of an exact But One thing equivalent. I'd like to say is, as you get ready to say that is just any student of logic would know that his argument is fallacious from right. the beginning because he already knows there's no word or no actual compiled Bible yet. Right. See, it hasn't been put together yet to be called the Bible. So needless to say, you're not going to find the word Bible in the Bible because it hasn't been put together. So or it's, a, it's a straw man. You're, exactly. You're, you're creating a, and then you're burning a straw man. There you go. So what do we find in the New Testament? Okay. okay, what did Paul teach? Okay, how about this? How about this? Where, where are you reading from? 
I'm reading from Galatians. Just turn randomly to Galatians. I said, I can turn to any book in the New Testament, pretty much refute that. <laughs> Galatians. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. And the scripture says this. Mm -hmm. how, about, how about this? For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. Where did you For read that it from? is written, read, every New Testament book has it is written, or what does the scripture say? Mm -hmm. Or as it is written. So you're just randomly just opening just, the book? I just randomly opened it up to the book of Galatians thinking, I wonder if Paul really taught the Bible. <laughs> well, I think he did if he's quoting from Scripture and, and asking the question, what does Scripture say? What does Scripture teach? And then he cites all these Old Testament references as proof of what he's teaching. Well, see, Jack Deere didn't Testament. say he, he did a computer concordance search of the word Scripture. Right. He did a computer concordance search of the word the Bible. Bible. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, and, and I think if, if we go through the New Testament, you're going to find constant reference to the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. As Scripture. Right. As the Bible. For instance, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. Mm. Now, that's adding the imprimatur of God right. to what is written in the Old That's Testament. Right. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out of them. He's quoting Isaiah. He's quoting Revelation. He's quoting 1 Corinthians. So to say that Paul didn't teach the Bible <laughs> is to say that he never quoted the Old Testament and he never tried to explain how the New Testament is fulfilling the Old Testament. Uh, you can see, like you said, it was just a straw man argument. Yeah. But these oneness, I mean, not, well, some of them are oneness Pentecostals, yeah. but these Pentecostals and Charismatics just buy into whatever nonsense yeah. they're given, and it's all to steer you away from biblical study. Right. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on here. Ooh. I want you to hear this next one from page uh, 104. It says, and finally, for the person who has difficulty getting caught up to heaven on their own, and for whom the many teachings by the prophets on how to make this happen have proven insufficient. See, these prophets and apostles tell you to have third heaven experiences mm -hmm. like Paul had. Yeah. And they give you formulas, sort of like uh, what they were trying to teach Nancy on speaking in tongues. Right. So there's, there's mechanical formulas to be able to do the same things. Um, and so they're trying to teach you, some of these prophets are trying to teach you how to have third heaven experiences, but it may not work out, but there's a solution. There's a solution to that. Okay, if it's, as you can see, as people at home can see this, uh, may prove insufficient. The Elijah list provides the following. Okay, this is the Elijah list, which is a charismatic Pentecostal uh, company. And uh, this is from their December 26, 2005 list. It says, quote, third heaven vision anointing oil, end quote. And for, you can get half an ounce of this for 10 bucks on an order, or you can get a quarter of an ounce for an $8 order. So it looks like it's a better deal if you just get the, eight, the $10 uh, half ounce bottle of uh, Third Heaven Vision Anointing Oil. And it says the Third Heaven Vision Anointing Oil is made with six ingredients from around the world. Calamus, cassia, frankincense, myrrh, rose of Sharon, and spikenard in a base of virgin olive oil. Each fragrance, each fragrance was chosen from different nations. It was individually prayed over and sanctified for the work of the Lord. May you have the, quote, third heaven visions with an exclamation point. This is from the ad. Tom Panich, the developer of the third heaven vision anointing oil, also has a teaching series to help would-be heavenly tourists 
gain access to the abode of God. Okay, uh, Rob, would you any comments? Uh, are you planning to buy some of this? What was that address again? I could use a, <laughs> I could use a third heaven experience right now. Is this for real? I mean, the show must go on. Larry, it's snake oil. It's absolutely potion. And Hocus you know, we, pocus. We, we've called it. We've called it a circus, and now we've got the potion to go with. That's the right. We got the snake. Oil. I call it the hocus got, pocus potion. Yeah, we've got we got the healing, <laughs> the, the healing lotion, and right next to it, the third heaven. Now, wouldn't it's you rank this heaven. with just absolute blasphemy? I would. I would rank it as uh, filth. Just, yeah. just. And the sad thing is, people that buy into this are just bringing curses from God down yeah. on their own heads. Yeah. They don't even realize that they're cursing their own souls with stuff like this. Okay, let's go on to page 136. With this basic understanding, we now return to C. Peter Wagner, and he's mainly the man that started all this apostolic reformation and being a, a, a prophet yeah, like modern, Paul modern and all apostle, the rest of them. Yeah. Uh, while admitting that the subject of open theism is controversial, Wagner nevertheless states that he has reached a conclusion on the subject. Now, here's this. He considers himself to be the top apostle right. living today. And here's what he says right. about open theism. He says, quote, I believe what is known as open theism provides us with the most biblical and the most helpful theological framework for doing our part in seeing, quote, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, end quote. Wagner attempts to comfort his readers that he is not drifting into heresy when he writes, quote, The issues at stake are not those that threaten the validity of Christianity or those that would be labeled heresy or those that question the authority of Scripture. They are simply respectable theological differences of opinion, end quote. So he's saying open theism is, you know, it's sort of like saying the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> You're, you're, <laughs> so you're the theologian, my guest, so I'm going to let you explain briefly to the audience what open theism is and, and brief comments so we can kind of move along here in the show. Yeah, open theism is the, the uh, theory that God cannot know the future until the future actually happens. That's why it's called open. God's open to gaining more knowledge. He gains knowledge as things happen, and he adds that knowledge to his repertoire of knowledge. Some think that God looks ahead down the tunnel of time, he sees an event happening, and he says, oh, that's what happens there. All right, I'll add that to my reservoir of knowledge. Others say he doesn't even look down the tunnel of time, he just simply waits to see what will happen, and then he reacts to it. How God reacts to it, and the ripple effect of God reacting are never explained in open theism. It's just the idea that God has not predestined anything. He has not willed anything to come to pass. He, has, he, he did create the universe, but he created it with only possibilities. And the possibilities are worked out as human beings make decisions for themselves. And these decisions have implications and, and effects for decisions that other people make. So in essence, what this man is saying is that this is okay. He puts it on a level of pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. If you're pre-trib, mid-trib, well, it doesn't really matter that much because it, we're gonna find out in the end. So he puts it at a low level, level of significance and he paints it as a, a, a valid theological understanding. Now, here's what's wrong with the whole thing. If God is open, that means the universe is random. That means all events are uncaused. They just happen randomly. It also means that God is not omniscient. Mm -hmm. It also means that God has no purpose that he's bringing to pass. It also means that every single Bible passage that speaks of God bringing to pass his purposes in his providential care of his universe are now circling the drain. 
because they are on their way down that drain. And it means that God does not ways. know the end from the beginning. No. And that also affects his other attributes like omnipotence. Right. So he doesn't have all power because he doesn't know enough. He to, doesn't know enough. And so it just destroys everything biblically, which... About God, right. Exactly. Right. And he looks at it as just something, oh, I yawned at that, you know. Remember in the first video we talked about the autonomy of man? Mm -hmm. You put all of these religions into a room? Yeah. All of them have one thing in common, and that's the autonomy of man. This mm -hmm. is the epitome of the autonomy of that's man. Right. Man runs the show. Mm -hmm. God reacts, if he can. Mm -hmm. If he can. We're mm -hmm. not even sure he can. Right. But man makes the decision. Man runs the show. So, for instance, God sent uh, Jesus Christ, but before he did this, and this is how this dovetails into Roman Catholicism in a big way, he sends an angel. He sent an angel to Mary. And that Mary evidently is, is stupefied by all this. And uh, so the angel, according to the Roman Catholic understanding of the passage, the angel is asking Mary, would this be all right with you? Can you handle this? Can we do this thing? And Mary says, yes. God breathes a sigh of relief. The whole world <laughs> breathes a sigh of relief. <laughs> And I'm not kidding you, Roman Catholic literature, big headlines, what if Mary had said no? Where would we be now? Mm -hmm. And therefore, they worshiped Mary as co-redemptrix right. because it was her yes that allowed the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Larry, we do want to make a comment that we are not making up this idea that open theism ruins the omniscience of God and ruins the, uh, the, the sovereignty of God. But uh, we want to make sure that you understand that Scripture is, is not to be ignored in all of this. And I just want to read one passage to you for, for the sake of, of the, the fact that we are coming from Scripture. And it's found in Acts chapter 4, verse 27. Now think of the idea of openness of God. He doesn't know anything that's going to happen. He has to wait until it happens before he can add it to his repertoire of knowledge. He doesn't pre-plan anything. He doesn't really will anything from eternity past. Everything is going to happen the way it happens, but God's watching like all of us. Set that against this, Acts 4.27. Luke writes, For truly in this city there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. It wasn't luck that the Jews wanted to destroy Jesus Christ. It wasn't luck that the Romans put him on a cross. It wasn't just happenstance. They did whatever God purposed, and predestined to occur. God is not a God arriving at knowledge. His will is from eternity past, and it will come to pass. I just wanted to mention that insofar as this openness of God idea is concerned. Now, as you can see on your screen there, in, uh, I just want to kind of back you up, uh, Rob, on what you just said when it comes to the sovereignty of God. Uh, you can see on your screen there, Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9, 10, and 11. And it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. You can cross-reference that to Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 24. And now look at verse 11. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. So I think as you people out there are looking at this Bible passage, I think it's pretty hard to accept open theism, right? In, especially in light of, I mean, 
basically, Rob, you can go anywhere in the Old Testament right. and the New Testament. Right. And you're going to find the sovereignty of God, that exactly. God's in control of everything. Right. I, I, I've often liked what R.C. Sproul said one time about it. If there's even one random molecule, molecule. running right. around out there that God doesn't control, yeah. that, that, that ends his, 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 his omnipresence, his, his sovereignty, and everything else. Exactly. If, uh, if God doesn't control everything, he doesn't control anything. And he's not God. And he's not God. Simple as that. Okay, let's get back to uh, the theology that in education we're receiving from these modern-day self-appointed prophets right. and, and apostles. We are the prophets testing the prophets right That's here. it. That's it. Okay, here's what we see next on page 137. Wagner outlines what he believes was the problem as he was educated in a Reformed seminary. He says, quote, Now that I look back, I see that our underlying problem was that no theological alternatives were presented to us. We were taught that God is sovereign, infinite, eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, that he was unchangeable, and that he was just, end quote. Remember that Wagner is claiming that being taught these fundamental beliefs about God was the underlying problem with his theological education. Okay, now, so he's basically saying it's because he believed all, he was taught all these things that we were just going over just a moment ago. Right. <laughs> that that messed up his theological understanding and right. grasp of God. Right, right. So, yeah, that kind of theological education, according to that testimony, is deficient. We would say just the opposite. Anything summed up by the mind of man to include a God that has less of those characteristics is no God at all. So there you are. You've seen uh, Peter Wagner's alternative, a God who is in charge of nothing versus a sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient God that we worship as God. So once again, what does the scripture say? The scripture doesn't paint God as an open-minded God arriving at knowledge, nor does it evacuate the sovereignty of God when it comes to willing all things that come to pass. It affirms it. It doesn't give us the answers we want ultimately in explaining God, but that's impossible because we as human beings cannot possibly fathom what the Apostle Paul calls the inscrutability of God and what God himself reveals that his ways are not our ways, his ways are higher than ours, and the secret things belong to him. Well, see, when you so. think about it biblically, or even just in reality, yeah. because the Word of God reflects the reality that we're actually in. Mm -hmm. There really is a God, a living God, as living as we are, or anyone watching. It, it reflects a God that who is really there, if there is a God at all, right. if there is a God at all, he would have to be omnipresent, uh, uh, you know, omnipotent. Uh, all these attributes that Wagner doesn't like, right. he's denying the only kind of God that actually could exist. Anything less than that, and it's not God. I think the other prophets in 1 Corinthians 14 are real close to standing up and shutting this guy down. <laughs> Just shut up. You're already in way too much trouble. Well, the problem this with is the lot of the Lord. A lot of these other prophets that are self-appointed prophets, though, are saying this stuff almost as bad as him. Right. Well, and so I, it's like a big uh, 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 mutual admiration society. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's a it's a bum prophets society. That's right. But the bum prophets are making a lot of money and getting a lot of power, right. and uh, they're also picking up some illicit situations at the same time. So. It's one of those things that comes with these. I think we're going to stay in the dead prophets society. For a while. <laughs> dead prophets do you a lot more good, they especially do. if they're the prophets that are writing these words. That's right. That's, <laughs> it. That's what I'm saying. But anyway, let's go back to some of these live prophets who mm -hmm. uh, claim they're as good as the, the, the dead prophets. Right. Uh, here on page, on page 148, we see another, the, an apostle 
Apostle Dutch Sheets. And uh, he's talking about God is weak in answering prayer. A classic example of the weak God of the modern prophets and apostles can be found in the writings of International Coalition of Apostles member Dutch Sheets. Sheets writes, quote, Recently, I believe the Lord showed me what sometimes happens when we come to him with a need, asking him to accomplish what he says in his word. In answer to our request, he sends his angels to get our bowls of prayer to mix with the fire of the altar. But there isn't enough in our bowls to meet the need. We might blame God or think it's not his will or that his word must not. Sorry, <laughs> we started over. I'm starting to laugh when I'm reading this. Um, let's see. We might blame God or think it's not his will or that his word must not really mean what it says. The reality of it is that sometimes he cannot do what we've asked because we have not given him enough power in our prayer times to get it done. He has poured out all there was to pour and it wasn't enough. It's not just a faith issue, but also a power issue. So here we have this apostle, Dutch Sheets, an apostle, no less, saying that God can't get things done because we ourselves haven't poured enough into the faith bowl or power, the prayer bowl or whatever you want to call it yeah. to, for God to have enough power to get anything done. How do you react to that? Once again, it's the autonomy of man. If man, it used to be if man will let God do things and God would be better off, if man would let God save him, then man would be better off. But now, evidently, according to this, God is running low on his battery power, and we have to juice him up. And we juice him up how? By longer prayers? I guess so. Offering longer prayers, mixing fire with our prayers, some oddball thing. Listen, this is just beyond bizarre. Any, anybody who is considering even listening to this guy has a screw loose somewhere as well. Because there's, there's absolutely, it's, forget about scripture, just common sense will tell you, God is God. If he spoke the universe into existence, I doubt he needs more power from me. Yeah, and he doesn't need your help either. He doesn't need my help. <laughs> oh, mercy. All right, oh, moving mercy. on to page 149. Uh, we're finding out about, as you can this see it on your screen. This is flabbergasting, by the way. It's just... Uh, as you can see it on your screen, we're, we're talking here about spiritual mapping. Man must help God out. Uh, charismatic uh, George Otis Jr., who's also a Pelagian. Uh, you may have to describe that to people what that is. But anyway, uh, George Otis G Jr. says, quote, Transformed communities do not materialize spontaneously. If they did, we might legitimately wonder why an omnipotent and ostensibly loving God did not turn the trick more often. We would also be left to ponder our own value as intercessors. Fortunately, such thoughts can be banished immediately. This is because community transformation is not an arbitrary event, but rather the product of cause and effect process. Right. So... You know, they've got a lot of the spiritual mapping going on where, mm -hmm. where you, you geographically set up a, an area in town or a county or something like that. And, you know, you pray all the demons out of it or, or whatever it is or, or concentrate your prayer here so you can concentrate the power of God in a, in a certain area to kind of clean things up. But uh, uh, basically he's saying a lot of these problems are, cause, are, are a cause and effect. The cause is we're not doing enough on our side to get the job done mm -hmm. because basically it goes back to what the other apostles saying that God's weak and he needs help. He right. needs, needs our assistance because it's cause and effect. So uh, any further comments along these lines? And also, by the way, this guy is a Pelagian. Uh, so you might want to explain to the folks at home what a Pelagian is. Now there's Arminians, there's Calvinists, right. there's Pelagians. Yeah, well, Pelagianism is a is a heresy that surfaced, or I, I guess uh, named after the monk Pelagius. I think it was a British monk, and probably around, I, I don't know, what, I think it's 4th century. 
I don't think it's third century, 300 somewhere. He debated Augustine on the freedom of the will and the bondage of the will and, and original sin primarily. But the gist of Pelagianism is that man has a free will. He's born without the taint of original sin. He has not suffered the nature of Adam in any way, shape, or form. Uh, he's not born in sin. He's not born in guilt. And he, he has uh, an entirely free will to choose what he wants to do. He can choose God or he can reject God. And he's not tainted by original sin of any kind. So this is Pelagianism. It's the idea that man, once again, is sovereign master of his choices. He's sovereign master of his universe. And he's sovereign master of uh, the matter of salvation. Because after all, since he has all this freedom, uh, any, any interference by God would be... Uh, a travesty, a, a raping of his will, and the, the Pelagians will have no part of this. So Pelagianism was, was uh, branded as a heretic in the early church councils. It's still a heresy uh, today. And so it doesn't surprise me too much to hear you say that this guy's a Pelagian because he would give this kind of autonomy and this kind of power to man. But what does the scripture say? Does the scripture say that that in order to get things done, in order to accomplish something good, in order to make life more livable or to have a community of saints that are, that are vibrant and strong for the Lord, that, that we, we as human beings, have to upgrade God's power, sort of give him a booster pack from our prayers or, or something. No, that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that, reading from Romans chapter 9, verse 18, so then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Why will you say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Or does not the potter have the right over the clay? This passage goes on to say that God was willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, and then to do that, he endured with patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. I can assure you that the scriptures paint an entirely different picture of God. He's sovereign. He's in control of his universe. He's in control of his plan. He, he has predetermined the events that are passing. He does so according to his own inscrutable purposes. And we, as mere human beings, have no right either to deduce that God is weak and God is in need of power or God cannot accomplish his will, nor do we have a right to answer back to God for what he has or has not done. That's right. It's God's prerogative. That's right. Well, basically, it comes down to the fact that these guys have a different God. Yeah, it is a different it, God. It's not the same God as the Bible. Right. So whatever it is they're worshiping, it's definitely not the biblical God. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you frame God in your mind, you either see him as a weak, impotent, uh, wannabe king of the universe, but can't accomplish his will because big bad man keeps getting in the way, and God is like sworn that he will not interfere with big bad man because big bad man has to have his way. Otherwise, there, there can be no possibility of anything being fair. This is the way the Arminians and the Pelagians uh, right. treat it. But the scripture will have none of it. Scripture mm -hmm. says God has mercy. He has his elect. He does what he wants with his universe. And you have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. We are to shut up and worship God. Amen. And we can't know him mm -hmm. intimately or ultimately. We cannot know God. It's impossible. He is God. And we are human. We are the creation. He is the creator. There's a vast gap that will eternally separate us from God. Well, when you say you can't know God, now we can know God through His Spirit in that sense. In but, that sense. But in the sense you're talking about, about not knowing God, you're talking about every little... We'd have to be infinite ourselves. We'd have to share His incommunicable attributes. We'd That's have right. to be omniscient. We'd have to be omnipresent. We'd have to be omnipotent. To we understand Him like to you're talking about. To understand Him, yes. Right. We can't possibly... Possibly well, know the psalmist, God as the God The psalmist knows even God. said what you said. These are beyond my, you know, mm. you're, 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 they're too wonderful for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, even, even the psalmist said that. Yeah. I mean, Paul says we have the mind of Christ. And that's very true. Mm -hmm. In the sense that we are, we are directed and driven by the Spirit of God inside of us. He's made Holy Spirit to dwell within us. 
And we do have the mind of Christ in the sense of knowing right from wrong and knowing God's prescriptive will for us here on earth. He has, he has taught us how we are to live. He has explained to us who we are, who he is. But get this, the same author who says we have the mind of Christ writes in Romans chapter 11, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Okay, before that, the Apostle Paul says these words, the depths, the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Mm -hmm. He needs my power? <laughs> it's sort of, sort of like when God's talking to Job. Yeah. Where were you when I set, set the Pleiades and all, you know, yeah. all these things? When I, hung, when I hung the morning star. Yeah. Okay, so the modern apostle is saying, God ran out of power. Then we got to build him up again. <laughs> it's blasphemy. It exactly. is blasphemy. Exactly. In a different right. God, yeah. in a different gospel, in a different Jesus, in a different right. spirit. Yeah. It's, it's all those things. Uh, now, you don't have to comment. I'm going to just read... Uh, these things quickly so we can move along a yeah. little bit because this kind of ties into what you've already refuted. Mm. Uh, but anyway, they all, these modern ap apostles like uh, the charismatic Bill Heyman says God is weak in eschatology. So he quote from him here, as you can see it on your screen, the full restoration of apostles and prophets back into the church will then bring divine order, unity, purity and maturity to the corporate body of Christ. So he's basically saying we need these new apostles and prophets to bring all this together. Then it goes on to say, or he goes on to say, that will in turn bring about the end of this world system of humanity and Satan's rule. The fulfillment of all these things will release Christ, who has been seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, to return literally and set up his everlasting kingdom over all the earth. So it really takes these new modern prophets and apostles to come back into the church and to, and to establish all this unity and everything so they can bring back Christ. He's, he's kind of stuck on that seat in heaven next to the Father, but until they do their job here, he can't come back. And so... Uh, so the, the modern apostles are going to clean up the church, right? <laughs> Get everything in order. No problem. <laughs> Of course, the Apostle Paul couldn't do it. None of the original apostles could do it. None of the original prophets could do it. <laughs> the, the body of Christ had troubles from day one. That's correct. And yeah. the Apostle Paul said, you will. The minute I leave this place, savage wolves will arise from among Acts you. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Yes. Coming. They're here. They're here yeah, now. That's right. And so, we get it. If the Apostle Paul, who we know is an apostle, and the prophets who we knew, we know, we, we, we know that they were prophets and, and they knew they were prophets back then. If, if they couldn't clean up the church and bring Christ back, these guys are going to do it? <laughs> Next. <laughs> right. So we see on page 151, these prophets can force God to act prematurely. Okay, the God presented in Scripture is the ultimate sovereign. He works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. He operates on his own timetable. The God of the prophets, these charismatic prophets, is remarkably, remarkably different in character. For instance, in a prophecy purportedly coming directly from the mouth of God, Teresa Phillips states the following, quote, It's not the Armageddon time. Be careful what you prophesy, says the Lord, for you can bring me to do something ahead of my time. For I hear the voices of my prophets, even now writing out the dispatches as if it were now. But America, I'm giving you another golden chance. America, I'm giving you the kingdom of advance. End quote. So here's God telling this prophet, that, you know, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm being forced to be, act prematurely, you know, ahead of my time. Yeah. This God that gives a, the, the prophet. And it's, 
And this was, thus saith the Lord, yeah. basically, in this quote. Yeah. Uh, it's incredible to me. Once again, man is sovereign, and poor God. He can even be rushed to do what he doesn't want to do. He can, he can actually be pushed into fulfilling a prophecy sooner than he wants to uh -huh. if these prophets down here get a little out of control. Remember, yeah. Kenneth Copeland said that God was the greatest failure. Oh. <laughs> so. Did you have to remind us of that <laughs> quote? <laughs> that, uh, for folks that weren't aware of that, they can, they can hear that from Kenneth Copeland's mouth himself uh, in a Episode number one, I believe it was, in this series that we're yeah. doing. So, yeah, exactly. so if you've missed any of the shows before this, just go back and check them out, and uh, you'll be uh, quite astonished, I think. So, Unless you've been believing these guys, then, of course, it'll be all that. But. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> Isaiah 42, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Would it not be sharing his glory with others just a little bit if it were possible for human beings, self-named prophets, to force God to speed up his time schedule? <laughs> Wouldn't they then have the glory in all of that? Mm -hmm. It's so bizarre. It's, it's detestable. Blasphemous. And if you didn't have some kind of moderate sense of humor with it, mm -hmm. it would just, it would be too stunning even to listen to. That's right, that's right. People watch this television? Oh, yeah. These are all uh, modern-day prophets. They've got lots of money. They've got lots of followers. And they, they're, they're saying these in things. Numbers. But yeah. These publicly. Are, and people are listening to them and saying, let's see, where did we I buy put this. Book? We're into this. Where did I put this book? Okay, let me bring this up again. All these quotes are documented in this book. Yeah. This book here, Wandering Stars, he documents everything right. on where it was said, what book it came out of, what sermon it came out of. Yeah. Uh, so anyone that doubts what we're talking about here, that's why I'm referencing this book. Everything's documented on where it came from right here. Yeah. And so uh, we're just having, we, we just have to be going through some of this material uh. to try to show a contrast yeah. so people won't be deceived by these false prophets. It's now, sickening. It's now, just a false. God with a false prophet attached to him. Well, you, you're yeah. going to be uh, surprised by what this next, next charismatic Pentecostal type modern day prophet has to say. This All is coming right. from Sean Boltz. And here's what he has to say. Quote, One day while grocery shopping, I began to hear a low rumble. Having grown up in California, I had lived through many earthquakes. I expected an earthquake was coming. And so I braced myself for the ground shaking, but nothing happened. Again, the sound came, yet no one around me appeared distressed. At that point, I wondered if I was having a spiritual experience. As I got to my car, the sound in my ears grew louder. Finally, I asked, quote, God, what is happening? End quote. And then the reply came back, quote, I am hungry. End quote, was his strange reply. So God tells him he's hungry. Then he goes, quote, Suddenly I realized those noises were from God's stomach rumblings. He was letting me hear his hunger pangs. As I began to pray about this, I was led to Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. In this scripture, Jesus shares a parable that illustrates a divine hunger. Jesus is hungry. For the fruit of our lives, the offerings of those who desire to feed the heart of God. Jesus longs for the fullness of what was promised to him by the Father in heaven. Now, Rob, I wanted to ask you, you know, I kind of 
grew up in Houston, Texas, and there's a lot of uh, thunderstorms mm -hmm. and things that go on there on a regular basis. And I mean, sometimes it gets so, it can get just dark in the middle of the day. You got the lightning flashes and everything, and the street used to flood from so much rain. And that's one reason they call it the Bayou City. But uh, as a kid growing throughout, you know, before I went to college at, at Austin, Texas, I was there for like 16, 17 years. But I'll tell you one thing, not once did I ever think that when I heard roll, rolling thunder or something like that up in the sky that I think it was God having a, a hunger pain in his stomach. You know, I might have thought it was angels bowling. That's what I always it. thought it was. And I'm sticking with the angels bowling. <laughs> and they're, they're bowling because they don't have anything else to do. And the reason they don't have anything else to do is that God keeps sending them down here to help people, and the people won't. Let him. And he keeps sending them down to save people, and the people won't let him. And he keeps sending them down to, to give aid and comfort, but the people don't want They don't want anything to do with angels. They say, get out of here. We can take care of ourselves. So the angels are in heaven. They've got nothing to do. So they bowl. <laughs> and when they bowl, they cry. And when they cry, these tears are big, and they fall down from heaven. That's where the rain comes from. And that's where the rain comes from. <laughs> That's as good as that. I always thought that when they bowl, they got a split and they couldn't make the spare and they cried because of that. But uh, anyway, that's just uh, bowling th 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 terminology. But it just goes to show you. <laughs> then I realized that was God's belly. <laughs> See, here uh -huh. you were wrong all these years. <laughs> no angels bowling, just God's belly growling. Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm a prophet too. <laughs> And I'm objecting to that. <laughs> you, you want the angels bowling. I do. Well, you know, in fact, this is a good point to bring this up. I, you know, we'll have some of these later in our series, but uh, a lot from John MacArthur's book. But there's John MacArthur's book, Strange Fire, called uh, The Danger of Offending the Holy Spirit with Counterfeit Worship. It's a, it's a great book. You may not agree with everything in it, but overall it's a well-documented book. It is. Uh, and you'll you'll reap great spiritual benefit uh, in this modern crazy age we find ourselves yeah. with these 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 uh, antichrist uh, apostles and prophets that claim to be of Christ when really they're not but uh, what's he brings up an interesting point here on uh, page 87 in 88 you can see it there on your screen I want to bring this in and I'm going to ask Rob a very pertinent question in relationship to what he just said about angels bowling mm -hmm. and all that stuff rather than page 88 or 89 just to lead into this as you as the viewers are looking at this page from John MacArthur's book uh, see down near the bottom of the page it says in the year 2000 Wagner this is C Peter Wagner began to lead the newly formed International Coalition of Apostles as the presiding apostle a position he held until 2009 when his title changed to presiding apostle emeritus. According to Pentecostal historian Vincent Sinan, when the coalition started, quote, new apostles could join and pay $69 a month as membership fees. Sinan himself was invited by Wagner to join, but later declined. As Sinan explains, quote, I didn't consider myself to be an apostle, and I wrote him that at $69 a month, I could not afford to be an apostle. Membership rates at the end of 2012 varied slightly, depending on apostles' nation of residency. The base fee was $350 for international apostles. The fee for apostles living in North America began at 450 per year or 650 for married apostles, meaning apparently a husband and wife team who both considered themselves apostles. Native Americans, First Nation apostles, could join for the same fee as an international apostle. In an attempt to organize the new apostolic movement, Wagner delineates two primary categories of apostle, along with several subcategories. Vertical apostles serve as the leaders of various ministries or ministry networks, whereas horizontal apostles help to bring together peer-level leaders 
for various purposes. But basically, the bottom line here is that, uh, you know, he had a $69 an apostle, as you can see at the top of the screen, base fee $350 for international, so forth, $450 if you're North American, and so forth. If you're a Native American Indian, you get the international rate. And Brother Rob, you had just mentioned earlier about the angel, you know, if you were an apostle, like these other guys, uh, you would have it as the angels, not, a, not God with his rumbling stomach because right. he's hungry. Absolutely. But now, see, now here's your chance. Because if you want to be an apostle like these other guys, but you live in North America, I think you're from North Carolina, right? you would have to pay $450 to be an apostle. So the question is, will you pay that $450 so you can say that it's really the angels bowling instead of God's stomach? Well, now that's an interesting proposition. I'd have to read the fine print of the contract to ah, find out that's a good exactly point. Now, that's a mistake a lot of people forget. What you know, kind maybe. of prophet I can be, and I want to know how many people are expected to follow me, because after all, i got to recoup the expenditure someplace. And the best place to recoup it would be the benefit that I give to the folks who would follow me as a prophet. So if they can guarantee that I can get this back in contributions mm -hmm. for all the good work I'm going to do as a prophet, then I think it would be a good investment. In fact, it would be pretty cheap. I think in I could double in my In fact, that's, that's actually not an, a prophet. It's, come to think of it, it's an apostle. A, an apostle. So you're even better than a prophet. It's cheap. I'll buy it. And I'm that, ready. That way you can start adding to that book that's sitting on your lap. I can have a following. And followers need to be blessed by God. And what's the so best way? Have an apostle create scripture. And to give your apostle the money. That's right. That way that they're really paying the $450 membership fee rather than yeah. you. Are you telling me that these people who gave money to the apostle Paul weren't blessed? If I'm an apostle, they're going to get blessed when they give their money to me. I so see. I think it's cheap. Now, I, I think of Acts chapter 8 when we're having this discussion. I'm thinking of another guy that wanted to do the same thing. I'm thinking of Simon Magus in mm. Acts chapter 8. Yeah. He's seen what the apostles are doing. They're laying their hands, the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, people being healed, all this stuff. And he's saying, man, I want some of that too. Right. And so he goes up to Peter. Remember that? Yeah. Say, hey, you know, how much money can I give you to get this power also? Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 8. Uh, now, do you remember what Peter said to him when he tried to give Peter money to become, have the power like an apostle. Didn't he say you're a little bit before your time, that's coming down, <laughs> and I don't want to be pushed? <laughs> I, I don't think he said that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're a little bit ahead of things, Simon. It's let's, coming, let's, but don't push. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this idea of selling certificates of apostleship and the presumably power that goes with it. In Acts chapter 8, we have an account of the uh, true apostles down in Samaria preaching the word of God. And they were laying hands on those who had received the word of God that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And we read in verse 17... They began laying their hands on them. They were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. Well, it doesn't take much to take this passage and apply it to what's going on when an organization sets up a certificate of apostleship and has the nerve to try to sell 
the gift of God to others for money. This is precisely what Simon wanted to buy. He wanted to buy the gift of God for money, and Peter Wagner and his ilk have set up an organization whereby they're going to sell the gift of God for money. And I say the same thing applies to them. Repent of this wickedness of yours. Pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. It's primarily the bondage of iniquity. Your motives cannot be for anything but the almighty dollar that you're worshiping at this point, and you are a false prophet, and what you are doing is absolutely abhorrent to any sensible Christian, and it's blasphemous to the Holy Spirit, and it is condemned by God, as you shall be should you continue on these kinds of courses, and yeah. anybody who follows you. Now, I just can't imagine buying an apostleship. Well, you just heard it for yourself, and it's all documented in John MacArthur's book. Now, yeah. one other thing I'd like you to expound for our listeners there from that passage. When, when, doesn't he use a strong Greek word there for perish? Like, doesn't he, isn't he basically, if you really get into the Greek, saying, may you and your money go to hell? <laughs> Something along that line? Well, it's let's see powerful. here. Uh, but may your silver perish with you. With that said, we can now see that the uh, prophet or apostle Rick Joyner, this charismatic guy who thinks highly of himself, says this, There is a tendency to continue relating to him as the man from Galilee. Jesus is not a man. He was and is spirit. He took the form of a servant and became a man for a brief time, end quote. That's Rick Joyner, one of these modern-day prophet apostle types from the charismatic Pentecostal vein. And so he's saying Jesus is not a man. He was and is spirit. He took the form of a servant and became a man for a brief time. It almost sounds like he's contradicting himself. Well, on the one hand, he said he's not a man, <laughs> but then in the next sentence, he became a man for a while. <laughs> what, what is his point? Everybody who understands Christianity understands that Jesus came in the flesh for a season in the incarnation and became as a man. Well, tell, tell the viewers who, God is, who Jesus is according to the Bible. Was he a man or not a man? <laughs> Jesus Christ in his incarnation is fully God and fully man. It's incomprehensible to us how this hypostatic union can possibly take place because we can't fathom how God can take on flesh, nor can we fathom how flesh can take on God. But nevertheless, the testimony of Scripture is true that he became like flesh, human flesh, and as such, he experienced the same kinds of vicissitudes and emotions and desires and the same kinds of uh, feelings that a human would have apart from sin. Now, The Last Temptation of Christ, the movie that came out many, many years ago, got in trouble because they assumed because Jesus was a man that he had carnal desires as well. And their fault was uh, not taking into consideration that Jesus was without, without sin, without a fallen nature, perfect man, and had no inclination towards sin. Therefore, he didn't carry with him carnal desires and was not guilty of having impure and, and thoughts that would, well, would well, qualify him as a guilty sinner. That's right. He was the yeah. second Adam. Yeah. So he, he was a clean and perfect as right. Adam was before he fell. Well, he was perfect. Uh, we say about Jesus Christ, just to keep the terminology straight, Jesus right. Christ was impeccable. Impeccable means not able to sin and able not to sin, both together. Adam was not impeccable. That's he was correct. created. He was created, and uh, the sin of Adam, Adam's commission of sin, was wrought by him, and he's responsible for it. 
And the fact that he did sin proves he wasn't impeccable. He could have sinned and he did sin. Jesus, being the second Adam, is far superior to this Adam. And, well, he's God and in the flesh. Adam, God in the flesh. And, and God cannot sin. Yeah, therefore, God cannot lie. Uh, his, the impeccability and the sinlessness of his nature are attested throughout Scripture. So, uh, it, it's, it's bizarre for this man to say, stop calling him the man from Galilee. Well, when he was from Galilee, he certainly was fully God and fully man. Very good. Next uh, prophet up is uh, charismatic Steve Thompson. And he says, quote, Jesus, having one back authority on earth, could now mediate and rule in the affairs of earth. However, Jesus did not stay on the earth to rule it. He ascended to the Father and is seated at his right hand. So who now is responsible to rule and reign in the earth? Believe it or not, the church, which is the body of Christ, end quote. So Jesus is not ruling now mm -hmm. because he left. He went back to heaven. So basically he's left the body of Christ down here mm -hmm. to rule and to reign over the earth. Yeah. Any comments? Uh, it sounds like a... a uh, it, Remember it, now, it, this is an apostle talking. <laughs> a frustrated <laughs> post-millennialist who woke up on a bad day and decided that uh, we need to start ruling and reigning this world right now. We can't wait for the millennium to come. It's got to be now. Well, of course, uh, the Lord did not give that kind of authority to the body of Christ here on earth when he left. And he didn't vacate that responsibility either. He did exactly what the Father bid him to do, successful in his mission, establishing the atonement for the redemption, reconciliation, propitiation of salvation for God's elect, and returning to heaven triumphantly, raised from the dead, ascending into heaven as a victor over this uh, satanic grip that uh, Satan has had uh, o over the creation in the sense that uh, he's taken the sting away from death and he is uh, uh, free God is free now to fully justify those because the perfect righteous has died for the unrighteous. Well, here we are on page 195, and we've got some more charismatic prophets. Paul Keith Davis talking, and uh, then we'll move to another one called uh, Kirk Bennett. Okay, here's what Paul Keith Davis says, quote, This apostolic reformation will ignite the reestablishment and functioning of the church in genuine, spiritual power and authority. From this foundation, the church will be able to soar to even higher places in God that await us. The Melchizedek priesthood and a deeper apprehension of being sons and daughters who have overcome and discovered rest in God. Now let me read what the other guy says, uh, Kirk Bennett. He says, quote, the Messiah was the forerunner of a different priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. And we were to enter into a whole priestly order with him. And we are all under the priestly order even now. We are all part of that order of Melchizedek, end quote. So basically what he's saying is he's replacing the foundation of the, the apostles as we find in the scripture with a new foundation of these new apostles and prophets. So that'll be our foundation. It's going to lead us to higher uh, uh, spirituality and all this stuff so we can yeah. be closer to God. Yeah. And, so, and it's going to be part of this Melchizedek priesthood. Now, it reminds me of the Mormons. The Mormons have an Aaronic and a Melchizedek priesthood. And it's always interesting because uh, uh, basically when you find uh, the order of the uh, New Testament church found particularly what is in Timothy and first and second mm -hmm. Timothy. Uh, you got, uh, you got elders, mm -hmm. you got deacons, things of this nature, but you don't really find priests. Right now, you know, in revelation, it talks about we're priests unto God, but mm -hmm. when you're talking about church offices, you don't really find that you're setting up a, a Mormon priesthood of Melchizedek. 
Uh, right. But that's what they're talking about here. I know it. They've selected the word Melchizedek, which makes no sense to apply that to the body of Christ because the Melchizedekian priesthood is designed and ordered and is a type of only one and one only, and that is Jesus Christ, who is our high priest. Not a whole bunch of other people in the body of Christ calling themselves Melchizedekian priests. But this is what they do. They pick a word and they rally around the word and it sounds esoteric, it sounds exciting, but it's all bubbles and bobbles, it's all pie in the sky, it means absolutely nothing. The Bible already tells us that Christians are a royal priesthood, a people of God's own possession, and we, as the body of Christ, are not going to submit ourselves to some sort of Roman Catholic, Mormon hybrid, new Melchizedekian priesthood. <laughs> not going to happen, not now, not ever. We've got the word of God. Amen. Amen okay. to that. All right. Let's move on here. We've got uh, Latter-day Prophets, the latter reign and dominion theology. Major tenets. Latter reign theology comes in a variety of forms and is therefore at times difficult to categorize in a general way. Uh, Tricia Tillen of Banner Ministries has done as thorough a job as anyone and we will work through her category. She lists the following doctrines as being integral in the latter reign charismatic movement. Uh, and here's what they say. One, the church must be restored and equipped to rule by the fivefold ministries. Next, it must come to perfection and complete visible unity. Next, out of the purified church will come a spiritual elite core a corporate Christ who possess the spirit without measure. Next, they will purge the earth of all wickedness and rebellion. Next, they will judge the apostate church. Now that's kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, 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 that's funny in itself. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, they will redeem all creation and restore the earth. They will eventually overcome death itself in a counterfeit of the rapture. And next, the church will thus inherit the earth and rule over it from the throne of Christ. So this, this lady set up their main goals. Yeah. Of course, she kind of put her opinion in there. Some of it's so ridiculous, she can't help but throw in her own idea about the counterfeit rapture, right. but, but, that, but that's what she thinks of it. Yeah. As uh, you read that, uh, I, I had one thought that kept coming back over and over again. This, this could have been the paradigm of the Third Reich. When you read what Hitler and the Nazis were planning on doing, purifying the world with a super race, right. controlled by an elite power, mm -hmm. sanctioned by God, restoring uh, unity and order in the world mm -hmm. under the uh, the Third Reich leadership. Right. It's all there, only it's in spiritual and churchy type terms. Using Christian terminology Using to Christian give it terminology. cover the veneer yeah. that it's Christian, yeah. when really it has nothing to do with Christianity. Yeah, and who are these super saints who are going to merge and control right. everything? It's these modern day prophets and I, apostles. They're lining up. They're sending their money in right now. Maybe they'll right. have a lottery and they'll choose them from the lottery. It's ridiculous. <laughs> All right. Now with that, let's see page 239. As you can see it on your screen, the prophet uh, Bob Jones. Now we covered him in show number one a mm -hmm. little bit. He recently died he at the time died, we're filming right. this. Uh, he said that the year 2011 was the year of the lion. Okay, now just reading here, it says, Another bizarre prophecy was given by Bob Jones shortly before the beginning of 2011. Speaking at a prophetic gathering, Jones stated that 2009 was the year of the ox, 2010 was the year of the eagle, and 2011 would be the year of the lion. Jones states that the year of the lion is a year of authority. He states, the year of the eagle will end on September the 10th, for I go with the Lord's calendar, which the Jews claim is theirs, but it's really not theirs, it's the Lord's. On September the 10th, the new year begins. It's the year of the lion. So it's time that the lion begins to roar. 
when the lion roars, he roars into the earth. He doesn't roar into the air. He roars into the earth. He says, this is my territory. And the vibrations will go out for miles and miles. So we're coming to the year of the lion. We're coming to authority. Get ready to see authority like you haven't seen before. He goes on to state that 2012 will be the year of the man and that all of this activity is to prepare for the harvest. All right. Now, it's the year of the lion. Yes. The year of the eagle. 2011. And, and the year of what was the other one? Lion, uh, eagle. Uh, let's see. Let me look it up here. The, uh, the year of uh, the ox. The ox. The ox. Well, first of all, the Detroit Lions haven't won a pennant since 1954, and in 2011 they were no better than any other NFL team. And I'm sure he's talking about the year of the Lion there. <laughs> the year of the Eagle, now that's different. They fired their coach because he didn't win the <laughs> NFC Championship. So that didn't work out for him. So he must have something confused here because there is no NFL team that's called the Ox. So he must have thought there would be the Ox who would come into being as a new team in Los Angeles because Los Angeles lost both the Rams and the Raiders. And as far as, he said 2014 is the year of the man? No, no, two, 2012. Year of the man? Yes. He's right there. Wasn't that when LeBron James made his decision to go down to, to Miami? And isn't he the man? Okay. I'm t this is all as bizarre and as, and as trivial and as ridiculous as anything that you could possibly conjure what, what up. What I liked about what you just said is the fact that what everything Rob just said about NFL football was as relevant to biblical theology as what Bob Jones said. That's right. About the 2009 being the year of the ox, uh, 2010 being the year of the eagle, and 2011 being the year of the lion. It right. had the same relevance. <laughs> goats, goats don't urinate in the air. They urinate in the ground. Come on. The lions roar into the ground. Well, the only lions that roared into the ground were their quarterbacks as they were dumped one time after another, and they were face down in the turf, <laughs> roaring into the ground. Honestly, it, where can you go with this stuff? It's, it's mean, not biblical, uh, but it claims to be, and that's yeah. really what we're trying to point out here in this series. Did he buy his prophecy papers from Wagner? Well, I didn't, I didn't check all okay. the background research. So he might have, you know. Yeah. He might have paid an extra fee so he could be extra special as yeah. a, you know, if he paid a little bit extra money, he might be you know, exalted a little bit more. Yeah, I think, Larry, that uh, it's sad because these guys are just pulling words and pulling terms out of the Bible. It's almost as though they wake up in the morning, throw the Bible open, and look, and they say, oh, there's the term lion, or oh, there's the term ox, or there's the term eagle. <laughs> yeah, put this together. I had a year. And they do this sort of thing, and somebody listens to them. I mean, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I, I made light of it all because I don't think it's worth anything. I think it's right. worth exactly the time we, we gave to it mm -hmm. with the, uh, the NFL counterpart. Now, you're, not, the, you're not talking about Bob Jones, the university, though. No, we're not talking about Bob Jones University. We're not talking about uh, Bob Jones, the basketball player. We're <laughs> not talking about, uh, we're talking about a, a modern-day self-proclaimed apostle right. named Bob Jones who recently has died. So he's right. on the list of the uh, modern day apostles. Right, right. Yeah, just so any, yeah. any Baptists out there that thought we were talking about the Bob Jones of Bob Jones University, not at all. Here we are on another page. We've got a, a, an apostle, a prophet named uh, Bill Yout, and he's going to prophesy, one of these charismatic Pentecostal guys. And he says, I heard the Father say, I am beginning to prophesy through commercials, candy, and clothing, especially over the holidays. I, I sense the Father saying, I will begin to meddle in the candy industry. I sense the Lord is going to begin to name some new candy bars. 
When these are named, they will release a prophetic anointing every time the name of the candy is mentioned. These names will have the power to call forth life and salvation. I am sure this prophetic candy is bound to have a heavenly taste to it that will be out of this world. People will end up tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. I saw angels anointing candy bar wrappers like God anointing prayer cloths of the Apostle Paul. Names on popular candy wrappers will speak prophetically to whomever reads or speaks their names. Candy wrappers will become like anointed prayer cloths throughout the land. End quote. In the same prophecy, Yalt said that Levi's genes were going to receive prophetic anointing to call forth the spiritual Levites of this hour and that Wrangler clothing would be anointed to tame the tongue and give people the tongue of the learned to speak a word to those who are weary, end quote. Yao ends this word with a statement, earth, earth, hear the word of the Lord, end quote. So, Rob, what we have here is a, and he starts out this prophecy from this, this charismatic apostle or prophet of the new reformation. He starts it out with, I heard the father say. So he's giving all this from, to, as coming from God, the father. Yeah. So uh, what do you think about anointed candy bars uh, and I, jeans? I think that these guys are making the prophets of Jeremiah 23 look really good. <laughs> really good at this point. I mean, as bad as these guys were in the Old Testament, they couldn't hold a candle to this garbage, okay? And what can we say, Larry? We can repeat the word over and over and over again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of God. I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream, I had a dream, candy bars at all. <laughs> How long is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood? even these prophets of the deception of their own heart. They intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal. Mm -hmm. That kind of trash only causes people to forget and in our day and age to mock the one and only true God and the one and only true Christian faith. So. Exactly. The sooner that these guys are destroyed from the face of the earth, die off, run off, get run off, whatever's going to happen to them, the better off Christianity will be. We can only feel sorry for them and pray for them mm. that, that our sovereign God would give them eyes to see and ears to hear. It is a sad tale. Oh, yes. It but is a sad tale. Like I say, they're doing it for uh, power, money, yep. and things of that. That's their yep. God. Yep. And when it comes to these charismatic prophets, when you think about it, the God they serve is not the true biblical God. Their God is, is, is filthy lucre. <laughs> that's, that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. Okay, one last quote, and we're done in this section. On December 31st, 1997, Rick Joyner and Bob Jones, the, not of Bob Jones University, but this, this, this charismatic apostle, uh, Bob Jones, prophesied that California was to be destroyed by earthquakes and nuclear bombs. The Mississippi River will be 35 miles wide. The timetable for this prophecy was nine months. Okay, obviously this prophecy did not occur. This is the failed prophecy which the Charisma article was referencing when it interviewed Francis Fragnapane about failed prophecy. Now that relates to some of the stuff in the in, in, the, in the book, but basically what I've got here and what the viewers are seeing at home, Rick Joyner and Bob Jones, two of them, two of their big guns in this modern reformation, uh, you know, this, the, these prophets. Uh, and they're, they're saying that 
the whole state of California is going to be destroyed by earthquakes and nuclear bombs. And as a result of this, the Mississippi River is going to end up being 35 miles wide. Now, we're doing this particular video series in the year 2014. Right. So we're already a long way off from the year 1997 when they said all this was going to happen within nine months. Right. And they're prophesying it in the name of God. Right. So what does this make these two guys? It makes them false prophets, <laughs> which is exactly <laughs> what we've been saying all along. But in reality, they'll wiggle out of it somehow. They'll, they'll say that they had a visitation from an angel, and the angel will say there's been a, a movement in heavens, and that was confused with the angels bowling, which was confused with God growling, which was confused with the lion bellowing into the earth, and the whole thing was a big bang, and they thought it was California going. And so you've got to excuse them. You've got to cut them some slack here. Problem, God doesn't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And when they say, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't happen, then the Lord didn't say it. Therefore, they're liars. Who do we feel more sorry for? Do we feel more sorry for these guys, self-appointed apostles who are up there duping people and probably high on some kind of drug when they're talking? Mm -hmm. Or do we feel more sorry for the people who actually follow them and listen to them and support them? I'm thinking of all the people who sit there and they get out their checkbooks and they write a check and say, oh, I want to support the Lord so much and this guy sounds so, he sounds so convincing and and, and I, I see his point of view, and he's got the scripture to back it, and so And then they write checks to these monkeys, and before you know it, uh, they're floating in and, and, and high water and laughing all the way to the bank. It really is a tragedy. It, it's, it's an, I mean, for the name of Christ, for the, for the gospel, for, the, for the, the whole reputation of Christianity, to have these people out there is just shame. Yes, and, and shame on them. And it affects all the unbelievers at the same time. Oh, it, it does. Because then they're thinking it just, true Christianity is a farce. Right. It's a, and so we come along and we say, these guys are phony, they're liars, they're manipulators, they're false prophets, they're motivated by satanic influences, and so forth and so on. And so we come across looking like we're destroying unity and we're mm. unaccepting and... I get this all the time from people who say, why don't you just leave Roman Catholics alone? Why can't you just love them and accept them as members of the body of Christ? I say, because they believe a false gospel. Worst thing you can do with somebody is leave them sit in a false gospel. See, there you go again. You're being divisive. Mm -hmm. Well, Larry, I think that we need to be divisive because it's the only way to cleanse the body of Christ from this kind of ridiculous oh, of course. and foolish and arrogant m m total malfunctioning of uh, the biblical text at the mouth of these self-proclaimed apostles. So, well, well, by being divisive, that's, we're just following what the scripture actually says to do. Yeah. Um, I was looking for it as you were, you were talking right there. It you is, with the it's first, Paul? It's, it, yeah, it's 1 first Corinthians Indian. chapter 11. You're yeah. seeing it on your screen. Right. It's right there, verse 18 and 19. It says, For first of all, when we come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it, verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Basically, he's saying there's going to be di differences so that yeah. those of you who are approved of God can be made manifest. Yeah. And so you've got to stand against this. You're, you're to rebu rebuke evil. 33% right. uh, of the New Testament is apologetic in nature against false prophets. Oh, I know it. Uh, <laughs> and, and his whole these, life was the, fighting this sort of thing. These guys... It's a different religion. It's like yeah. Mormonism. Right. It's, it's like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian right. science. And they make it up as they go. So. That's right. That's right. In fact, yeah. a, a great, and it ties back into what you were just saying there about how you felt sorry for all these people mm -hmm. that are falling into this trap, yeah. this satanic trap. And, and Ezekiel has a, you can see it on your screen here, Ezekiel uh, 13, chapter 13, verse 6 and following. It says, 
They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision? And have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord hath said it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, Therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am God. And the key verse that brought this to memory while you were saying that is verse 10 in uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 10 says, And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Yeah. So it's just like you were saying. They and their followers. The followers, the, the false prophet's going to be destroyed, basically, like you were saying, by God mm -hmm. in the end. And uh, their curses on them are, are incredible. I'd hate to be in their shoes on Judgment Day. Yeah. But then those who followed after them are going to suffer the same fate. Blind leading the blind. They both fall into the pit. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, anyway, Rob, uh, we're out of time for this uh, program. Uh, I thank you so much for being with me on this uh, broadcast, this series of shows we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's, what's funny about it is this isn't even the end of the series. But uh, for now, it's the end of this particular show. Uh, I'd like to con conclude by just telling people again to get your hands on this book by John MacArthur, Strange Fire, The Danger of Offending the Holy Spirit uh, with Counterfeit Worship, which is what we've been seeing all over the place. Mm. Uh, you may not agree with everything he says, but there's a lot of great documentation to back up and validate what we've been saying ourselves here. And I'd also like to encourage people, you can see it on your screen, to, uh, since you're watching this anyway on YouTube, go to John MacArthur's Strange Fire Conference. There you can see him from uh, General Conference Session Number 1, uh, talking about uh, these very things that we've been talking about. I would also hear, Here's a, a Strange Fire Conference Number 10 with Justin Peters. Uh, th this stuff is really good by Justin Peters, the devilish puppet master of the word faith movement. Uh, another one from Justin Peters, part 16, uh, on the spiritual shipwreck of the word faith movement. And one I enjoyed also here, but I, the whole series is great. So check it out. R.C. Sproul's in some of these mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, Strange Fire Conference number nine by Pastor Phil Johnson. Is there a baby in the charismatic bathwater? Mm. And he spends an hour proving that there's no baby at all no. in the, uh, the, the bath water. It's just dirty bath water is yeah. basically what it is, <laughs> as, as you've been saying, dirt. Yeah. Well, that's an awful murky uh, bathtub, let me tell you yeah. what. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, check those videos out on YouTube. Check our, our playlist uh, on our Christian Answers, See Answers TV uh, YouTube channel. Uh, just scroll down a little bit. You'll find our, our playlist on uh, phony TV preachers. And, uh, and in fact, this whole series will be on that playlist. So if you're only seeing this episode and want to see the rest of them with Rob and me, go to that playlist and check those other ones out as well. All right. Well, Rob, thank you again, brother, for being with me. Great I really to see appreciate you again, Larry. It. Yes. And uh, thank you for joining us. Keep in mind that the Jesus these guys have been talking about is not the Jesus of the Bible. We want you to center in on the Word of God, the, 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 the real Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You don't need to go to these modern-day prophets and apostles. You don't need to go to the Virgin Mary. You don't need to go to Ellen G. White, the Seventh-day Adventist. You just need to go to the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. Go to Him, and thou shalt be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. With that, thank you for being with us. God bless you, and join us again next time. Amen. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button, and then by also clicking the bell above 
to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.